This is Nightly Business Report with Tyler Matheson and Sue Herrera. Funded in part by... All it takes is a spark. One idea to take flight. The courage to seek the unknown. To innovate. Disrupt. To move us all forward. To explore a different perspective. At NASDAQ, we connect the world. It's ideas. It's capital. It's businesses. The people that drive global economies. The future isn't tomorrow. It's right now. All it takes is a spark. NASDAQ. New priorities. President Trump wants more money for defense and less for other departments and programs as he tries to reshape the federal government. Political heat. Why health care's middlemen are once again at the center of the debate over drug prices. Paying you back. Can your dividend stocks thrive as interest rates rise? Those stories and more tonight on Nightly Business Report for Thursday, March 16th. Good evening, everyone, and welcome. President Trump released a more than $1 trillion budget blueprint today. The proposal reflects the new administration's vision to dramatically remake the federal government. It includes a $54 billion increase in defense spending. It cuts funding to the Environmental Protection Agency by 31 percent, to the State Department by 28 percent, the Departments of Labor and Agriculture by 21 percent. It also completely eliminates funding for smaller departments and programs, among them the National Endowment for the Arts, the Corporation for Public Broadcasting, the Global Climate Change Initiative, and others. The proposal is a partial plan and does not touch entitlements like Social Security and Medicare. Now, the full budget is expected to be released in May, but the White House budget chief says this blueprint broadly outlines the president's priorities. He wants more money for defense, more money for border enforcement, more money for law enforcement generally, more money for the vets, more money for school choice, and then to offset that money with savings elsewhere so that all of that is done without an additional dollar added to the deficit. As I've mentioned before, this, this budget does not balance the budget. This budget simply reallocates and re reprioritizes spending as any family or business would do. John Harwood is following the story for us from Washington. John, this feels to me like a businessman's way of attacking a political budget. Uh, it reflects his campaign promises. What about the border wall? Well, he does include money, uh, both about a billion and a half dollars in the current fiscal year, about two and a half in the second fiscal year, in the 2018 fiscal year, uh, for that border wall. So that will go for engineering in the beginning of design phases, assuming that Republicans in Congress go along with this, and I expect that they will. John, what's the reaction been from fellow Republicans so far? Well, here's the issue with this budget. It seeks to shift $54 billion from defense, uh, I'm sorry, to defense from domestic programs. To accomplish that, he's going to have to pass a law adjusting caps that have been in place since the second term of the Obama administration. That would, law would have to clear a filibuster, meaning he'd have to hold all the Republicans and get some Democrats. That is not likely to happen because even Republicans agree with Democrats that they've cut an awful lot out of discretionary programs. They want to turn to the big entitlement programs like Medicare and Social Security. But Donald Trump has promised not to do that, and this budget does not do that. All right, so we often hear that a budget is dead on arrival. Is that true of this one? Well, I think that big trade, the $54 billion in either direction, I think that will not happen. They will not get 60 votes in order to accomplish that. Some of these cuts... Uh, will happen on the domestic side. I think one potential outcome is uh, there will be defense increases as well. It's many Democrats as well as Republicans favor those. But as a price of agreeing to the defense increase, Democrats are going to insist on higher numbers for some of the domestic spending programs. That's a potential deal here. Yeah. What about the rest of the Republican agenda as it pertains to or is impacted by this budget? Well, it does not, this budget does not reflect anything for an infrastructure program. That is the, uh, to come after tax reform and after Obamacare uh, in the president's priorities. But they do have to have Congress agree on a budget after they deal with Obamacare in order to get the expedited so-called reconciliation bill that would allow them to do tax reform, cut the corporate tax rate later this year. So some agreement between the House and Senate on a budget is vital in the middle of this year to getting to tax reform. All right, John, thank you very much. John Harwood in Washington with analysis tonight.
The Department of Transportation faces a funding cut of about $2.5 billion under President Trump's proposed budget plan, and the changes could impact the nation's travelers. Morgan Brennan has the details. President Trump's budget blueprint includes some sweeping changes to transportation, both on the ground and beyond. It cuts the Department of Transportation by 13 percent, including no more subsidies for commercial air travel service to rural areas and no more support for Amtrak's unprofitable long-distance service. Amtrak CEO Wick Mormon warning, quote, these trains connect our major regions, provide vital transportation to residents in rural communities, and generate connecting passengers and revenue for our Northeast Corridor and state-supported services. The railroad's long-distance lines comprise the only Amtrak service in half of the 46 states it serves. The cuts are already drawing the ire of some Democratic lawmakers. The president says he wants to increase uh, infrastructure, but slashes the Department of Transportation. Uh, so it, it's a somewhat uh, hypocritical and contradictory budget in, in many respects. Perhaps the biggest change is privatization of air traffic control, a plan that's been shot down before. The concept to transfer those FAA duties to a private non-governmental organization. We would add it directly to the bottom of productivity of you and everyone else, plus the airline. So the wasted time in route, taking routes circuitously and rather than run direct. Technology is there, they just have to implement it and they can't afford to do it under the current budget. Potential winners, major passenger airlines, which with the exception of Delta, have backed privatization in the past, as well as satellite operators and rocket providers, if the upgrades, which involve GPS rather than radar, are deployed even faster. Potential losers, regional and cargo airlines, which previously warned this could give the big passenger carriers too much power. Lift off. As for NASA, the proposal shaves nearly 1% off the space agency's budget, though acting administrator Robert Lightfoot does call it a positive for its core mission of exploration. It's a win for commercial space companies as well, as the journey to Mars remains on track and more government launches will be outsourced. Stellar news for Lockheed Martin, Boeing, Orbital ATK, Aerojet Rocketdyne, and of course, Elon Musk's privately held SpaceX. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Morgan Brennan. The president's spending proposal cuts the budget of the National Institutes of Health by about 20%. It's a departure from the recent funding increase, which came with bipartisan support. The administration says that the new funding proposal will help focus resources on the highest priority research. The agency distributes funding to about 300,000 scientists worldwide. But Washington isn't just focused on the budget, but also health care. And in an interview last night, President Trump took on a lesser known part of the health care system, the middlemen. This is this group that plays a really big role in how much we pay for prescription drugs. Meg Terrell explains. President Donald Trump has made no secret of his thoughts on the price of medicines. Uh, they're getting away with murder. Uh, pharma. We should implement legal reforms that protect patients and doctors from unnecessary costs that drive up the price of insurance and work to bring down the artificially high price of drugs and bring them down immediately. Since he was elected, Trump has reiterated that he plans to bring drug prices down. The president gets uh, criticized sometimes for inconsistencies, but he's been absolutely consistent uh, for over a year now. Uh, about wanting to do something about drug pricing. Typically, his comments have focused on drug makers themselves. But last night, in an interview on Fox News, the president brought another party into the conversation, saying, quote, we have a middleman system. We're going to get drug prices so far lower than they are now, your head will spin. So who are these middlemen? There's three elements of the pharmaceutical supply chain in the U.S. You have the distributors, which are the box movers. They uh, deliver the drugs around the system to pharmacies from the pharmaceutical companies. You have the pharmacy benefit manager who essentially uh, decides, you know, based on your coverage, what you have to pay in terms of a copay or out of pocket, you know, what drug you're supposed to get based on the formulary your uh, employer has chosen, and then what form or, or what area, you know, you can pick the drug up in, whether it's in the mail or in a retail setting. And then you lastly have the retail pharmacy, which is the storefront. Of those, pharmacy benefits managers, or PBMs, have been taking the most political heat in the drug pricing debate. Major PBMs are Express Scripts, CVS Caremark, and UnitedHealth's OptumRx. 
PBMs were thrust into the national spotlight during the outcry over the price of the EpiPen, as Mylan's CEO told Congress that more than half the price of that drug went to others in the supply chain, particularly PBMs. It's a narrative the PBM industry rejects. There's no question a lot of drug companies would just rather PBMs go away because we negotiate big discounts from them. And without us, they could charge whatever they want. But the people who hire us, the health plans, the unions, the government programs, want lower drug costs. And we're going to negotiate lower drug costs. The president said he plans to tackle the issue of drug prices in upcoming legislation. Who knew, as he said recently, health care could be so complicated. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Meg Terrell. And healthcare stocks pulled the broader market lower on uncertainty over the fate of the Republican backed health care bill. Energy stocks were also down, offsetting the gains in financials. The Dow Jones Industrial Average lost 15 points to 20,934. The Nasdaq was up fractionally, and the SP 500 was off three. And with the Federal Reserve meeting now in the rearview mirror, investors are asking what's next for stocks. It's a simple question. But as Bob Pisani explains, the answer is a bit more complicated. Stocks have cleared two of three major hurdles in the past day, but the final hurdle may be the most difficult one of all. We saw a market-friendly outcome from both the Dutch election and the Federal Reserve meeting. The Dutch appear to have turned back a populist tide, and the Fed has calmed rate hike jitters by clearly implying rate hikes would continue to be gradual, which means three hikes this year and three next year. Now, the market has convinced itself that it can keep going, even though the Fed is changing its stance from being data-dependent to keep raising rates for a while. That's a big change. But that's only happening because of the last hurdle, the Trump rally, this magic elixir of tax cuts and lower regulations and infrastructure spending that has arguably been the main driver of this rally. The question is, has the market already discounted the full effect of Trump's proposed policy plans? My opinion, not at all. There's still plenty of room for stocks to rally. It's one thing for the markets to move on vague hopes for pro-growth plans, but it's another when you actually see real numbers. And we don't have those numbers yet. And when that happens, I think we will likely will get a second boost. Thomson Reuters estimates that cutting the effective tax rate to 20 percent from 26 percent now would boost earnings 8.7 percent. That's a huge jump after several years where earnings have been declining. The market has rallied on these expectations, but don't kid yourself. No company has changed their guidance and few analysts have boosted their numbers so far. When it happens and they change guidance, that's when the second boost can occur. The downside is that if we get a smaller loaf than expected, especially a much more modest tax cut, the market will be disappointed. For Nightly Business Report, I'm Bob Pisani at the New York Stock Exchange. Following the Fed's interest rate increase yesterday, banks were quick to raise their prime rate. Uh, that is the rate at which banks lend to their most creditworthy customers. In other words, how much they charge to borrow money. M&T Bank was the first major bank to say that its prime rate was going up 4% from 3.75. Citibank quickly followed, as did others. Get ready to pay more. Yep, especially for a home loan, because rates for home loans have hit the highs for the year. According to Freddie Mac, the average rate on the 30-year fixed rate climbed to 4.3 percent. It was 3.7 percent a year ago. The move higher was last, last week was in anticipation of that rate increase by the Federal Reserve. Higher mortgage rates did not hurt home construction last month. New residential construction climbed 3 percent to a four-month high, led by the strongest pace of single-family home building since 2007. And it's the lack of single-family homes on the market that have helped keep prices high. Any increase in home building could help alleviate housing's supply issues. Still ahead, a hot Wall Street debut for an apparel maker, even as the broader retail industry struggles. New evidence today that the labor market remains taut. The number of job openings rose 3 percent in January from the prior month. The Labor Department report also showed that more than 3 million people quit their jobs in January, the most in nearly 16 years. And a rise in quitting tends to push up wages. And it's usually a sign of confidence in the job market since workers quit if they think they can find another job quickly. 
And in another sign of a tightening labor market, the number of Americans filing for unemployment benefits fell last week. This as layoffs remain near the lowest levels in decades. Jobless claims dropped by 2,000 to 241,000. Claims have been under the key 300,000 level for 106 straight weeks, the second longest streak since the mid-1960s. The president has said that he wants to protect American jobs by reworking some trade deals. And today, Treasury Secretary Steven Mnuchin took that message to the world stage, where he pushed for free and fair trade agreements at a meeting of global finance ministers. But he made it clear that the United States is not interested in a trade war. Our focus is creating economic growth that is good for the United States and good for the rest of the world. And it is not our desire to get into trade wars. It is our desire to deal with where there is imbalance in certain trading relationships that uh, we have a means to address that. Secretary Mnuchin also said that he thinks the U.S. economy can get to a sustainable growth rate of 3 percent or more. And Secretary Mnuchin also told lawmakers that he has started using different bookkeeping measures to avoid breaching the new debt ceiling limit at a level near $20 trillion. The process will buy five months or so for Congress to raise the limit. A 2015 bill marked today as the date that the debt limit goes back into effect at whatever debt level existed yesterday. Canada Goose shares head north in their market debut, and that is where we begin tonight's market focus. The maker of high-end jackets opened trading at $18 a share on the New York Stock Exchange today. That was higher than the company's IPO filing price of $12.78. In total, the company raised $255 million, and the CEO says it's just getting started. We feel that we have a tremendous amount of geographic uh, expansion opportunities. Uh, I've met with a lot of people while I've been uh, on, on the road for the last two weeks, and a lot of the investors agree that we can grow in, 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 in the United States for sure. Internationally, Europe has a lot of runway, Asia has a lot of runway, and new products. And, you know, we, make, we are committed to making best-in-class products. Shares finished up nearly 26 percent to $16.08. Well, despite seeing lower foot traffic, Dollar General benefited from customers spending more per transaction in the latest quarter. The discount retailer reported higher same-store sales and revenue, both coming in ahead of estimates. Profit also up. Uh, Dollar General up 39 cents to 73.20. And the biotech company PTC Therapeutics will buy Marathon Pharmaceuticals, Duchenne muscular dystrophy drug, for about $140 million. The treatment won government approval last month and gained attention when Marathon gave it a list price of $89,000 a year. PTC said it would re examine the price of the drug. Shares fell 19% to $8.84. 3M is buying Johnson Controls' safety gear unit for $2 billion. That deal will add various protective products for firefighters, police, and industrial workers to 3M's personal safety division. Shares of 3M were off a fraction to 190.31, while shares of Johnson Controls were down 16 cents to 41.77. Aerospace and defense company Arconic received a letter from activist investor and shareholder Elliott Management asking for an explanation regarding a, quote, questionable transaction that was recently disclosed. Elliott Management has had a rocky relationship with the company. Earlier this year, it wanted to replace Arconic's CEO and nominate new board members. Arconic shares up six cents to 27.32. Tennessee state officials say that they found a deadly form of bird flu for the second time this month in a U.S. farm that Tyson Foods gets its chickens from. Earlier this month, the disease was identified at a nearby location, which also supplies Tyson with poultry. The Tennessee Department of Agriculture said that they are working to contain the newly found flu. Shares of Tyson fell nearly 2 percent to $62 even. And the software company Adobe Systems posted its 12th straight quarter of higher revenue. The result topped analyst expectations, as did profit. The company's CEO said business was strong. As it relates to Creative Cloud specifically, we saw strength across the board. We've talked about how international represents a good opportunity. That did well in Q1. Small and medium business, which is our team's offering, uh, did well as well in Europe. And we continue to do a really good job with focusing on delivering value for our existing customers. So retention also had a great quarter. 
Adobe shares initially rose on the news after hours, adding to a slight gain during the regular session, where shares closed at 122.35. Coming up, looking for income? Will investing in dividend stocks still be profitable as interest rates rise? Dividend stocks have been on a tear since low interest rates have made them more attractive than bonds for investors. But now that the Fed has hiked rates and is expected to do so several more times this year, will dividend stocks get hurt? Jeremy Schwartz is director of research at Wisdom Tree Asset Management and joins us now to discuss that. And you make the point, uh, Jeremy, first of all, welcome, that there are really two different types of dividend stocks and, and investors have to know the difference between the two. Well, yeah, thanks for having me. Uh, and certainly there's, I call, I call it these two baskets of stocks. One is there's the ones that are slower growing, high yielding, things like utility stocks, where they steadily raise or have high yields. Those are more sensitive to interest rates. There's what you call bond proxies. They, when interest rates go up, they face more pressure, uh, more competition from higher interest rates. You have stocks that can grow dividends faster over time. Uh, because they can grow faster over time, they have a smaller current yield, uh, but they're less sensitive to, to rising interest rate pressures. And I think that is really where I think valuations, because everybody's looking for yield, yields are still historically low. Uh, I think the valuations are actually more attractive today on the stocks that can grow dividends faster over time. Mm -hmm. So not the uh, sort of the bond proxies that you might find in telecom, uh, maybe energy, maybe utilities, correct? Yeah, real estate investment trust is another part of that sort of bond proxy segment. I mean, I think at the search for yield, everybody's flocking to those stocks. The, the valuations are a little bit higher than normal. And I think these dividend growth stocks, maybe technology stocks, healthcare, some consumer oriented stocks, they're lower current yields, but okay. I think they have more growth prospects. All right. And you gave us three names that you might want to consider Apple, Microsoft, and J&J. &J. Why? Yeah, I, I actually tend to believe Wisdom Tree, we, we create ETFs and they're very diversified baskets. Those are three of our top holdings in our quality dividend growth ETF, DGRW. Uh, and they just represent the characteristics, high profitability. Um, they're sort of the Warren Buffett type factors of return on equity that people look at as a factor that can grow dividends over time. Uh, and because they're very profitable, they have that potential to grow that dividend faster over time. And so there are three, three largest holdings in that DGRW. You know, sometimes ETF. a big, juicy, fat dividend can signal that the underlying stock is not healthy. How do you separate the wheat from the chaff and avoid getting trapped in a situation where the company may either cut the dividend or have its stock price just collapse? Uh, that's absolutely why I, I advocate for broad diversified baskets. So the risk of any single stock, yes, it can cut its dividend. When you look at the market as a whole, there's very few times when the market's dividends have fallen more than a few percent. Uh, and so for the S&P 500, it's only been five years in the last 60 years where it fell. The financial crisis in 08, 09, when financials cut their dividends, certainly that was a big part. Energy last year, the energy sector cut their dividends yes. 10 to 11 percent on average. But everything else in general has been growing their dividends 5 percent a year on average. And so that is why I advocate for diversified All baskets right. more than single names. Jeremy, we'll leave it there. Thank you. Jeremy Schwartz Thank with Wisdom much. Tree Asset Management. And that will do it for Nightly Business Report tonight. I'm Sue Herrera. Thanks for joining us. We want to remind you, this is the time of year your public television station seeks your support. And I'm Tyler Matheson. We thank you for your support. Have a great evening, everybody. We will hope to see you back here tomorrow night. Nightly Business Report has been funded in part by... All it takes is a spark. One idea to take flight. The courage to seek the unknown. To innovate. Disrupt. To move us all forward to explore a different perspective. At NASDAQ, we connect the world, its ideas, its capital, its businesses, the people that drive global economies. The future isn't tomorrow, it's right now. All it takes is a spark. NASDAQ.